Um, first of all, I promise you all that I will bring those Steam Fever DVDs from South Africa. What, it, what happened about three weeks before, the guys told me, no, I can't bring you my DVDs, they won't fit the American system. So he said he would organize more and meet me at the airport with them, and he didn't. He didn't get them ready in time, so I haven't brought those, those South African DVDs. All, all I can tell you is, when I started in 1973, we were on hand and then we, when we transferred to mechanicals, uh, we were never given any written instructions. Um, you, would, you, would, you would be given two, two or three trips as a third man on the footplate, and the, the fireman and the driver would pass on to you what their experience was, and then you spent the next few months learning it. So all I can, all I can do is pass on as I learned it, and um, sometimes it may not conflict with, it may conflict with what, what you might have read, it might conflict with other things, but anyway. Um, when, when, I, when I first started on mechanicals, they, they threw me in the deep end, they put me on uh, GMA and Garrett's with Berkeley Stokers, with the worst possible coal you could imagine. And um, <coughs> it, you just get huge clinkers and so on, and uh, it, it was just a battle. And um, the GMAMs have got something like 14 or 15 slides. And if, if you're down on the 13th slide and you suddenly notice you've got no coal in the cover, you've got to open the door, walk back 13 slides, battle to open the 14th slide, by the time you got back you've got no steam, no water, nothing. So that, they were... Um, and like, like some of you guys, <coughs> they put me on for about three trips, and they say, right, you have a go. And when, when I have a go, there's nothing. The steam comes down, the water comes down. And I stand there in amazement, watching, watching Flip Ramers. Flip Ramers used to fire this Berkeley with an atrocious cold. It would lay down the red mark. As soon as it was my turn, nothing. So don't get this out, because I, I was four months on those Berkeleys. Um, then I transferred to the, uh, the smaller 482s, or the bigger 482s, with a 63 square foot brake. They had the same HD stoker. I was five months on them before, and I still wasn't proficient. And then in July 76, I transferred permanently to Darwin. We got the 484s with a 70 square foot grate, which is 90% smaller than your grate. And I was there eight months. I started in July 76. It was early 77 before I felt confident to get on any engine and, and, and play with it. And what, what I used to do, we used to have a, we had a stud of 70 of those engines. We had 74 S4s basically that are. And I well remember that, because we were, they were all pulled, so I get a different engine every trip. And I well remember having a notebook and writing down the jet settings and everything for each engine. And then if I got the same engine a week later, I'd get my book out and then I'd set it out. So it, that, that helped. Uh, Were they all different? Yeah, Did every engine had every, different jet settings? No, yeah, yeah. Every, every engine was different depending on the draft, depending on, yeah. the, on the state of the table, what the, what the table looked like, whether it was a new table, old table, bent up, that flat, up or down, uh, and so on. So come, come into these QJs, so I'm, the, uh, basically I'm firing exactly, exactly what I've been firing for the last 20 odd years. The only difference is my, my great area is 19% bigger on these, I believe it's 83 square foot. No, it's 70. 70? Yeah, it's 70. On a QJ? Yeah. Uh-uh, I, I worked it out 83 square foot from the Chinese manual. No, I can't. Well, but if it's 70, it's, it out, it's exactly... When I worked it out, it was 70. So. That's all I remember. To get the measuring tape. There's a, I, I worked it out from the China handbook as 83. Anyway, there's three differences. The size of the grate, which not a big problem. These don't have any jet gauges. Our 25 NCs, three, three of the five jets had gauges. The, 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 the two front jets and the fine coal, we had gauges. So this one you're guessing. The, oh, you've got, a gauge, you've got a gauge on your Mass. main. But we, we never had that. And the other, the other reason is that these you're getting far, far better coal than I'm used to, so it, it works out easy for me in comparison to the sort of coal I was used to. Uh, <clears throat> these are, I, these, I can only tell you the tips and, and how, how, what I've learned over the years. When you're raising steam, don't turn on your stoker until, or, or, uh, until you've got full steam. If, uh, sometimes you're in a hurry, you've only got 50 pounds steam and you want to you wanna start rolling it. That's a good way to break your stoker worm or break your linkage. So wait, wait till you've got full steam before you start operating the stoker. Rather bring the steam up by hand. And as far as your reverser is concerned, um, don't, don't, except in exceptional circumstances, don't reverse your stoker screw while, while it's turning. Close the stoker, and then if you want to reverse it, then reverse it and then open it again. The only time we've ever um, reversed the 
stoker worm, wireless, while it's operating is if you've got a big lump of coal stuck or even a, a piece of iron stuck in there and you can't get it out and you want to de-wedge it. <coughs> but that, that's another good way to, to break, break your linkage if, if you do that pressure. The reason, the reason that you would reverse, you, the reason that you would put your stoker worm in reverse, there's two reasons you could do that. If, if, uh, if you've got large lumps of coal blocking your conveyor and you want to uh, your, blade is, your conveyor is jammed, then you can reverse it a bit to, to loosen them up. Or if you want to close the slides, if, if sometimes if you want to close your slides with the, with the, with the pricker and it doesn't want to go, if you reverse it, the, 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 the force of the coal going backwards will help you reverse your, uh, close your slide. Uh, if, you, if you want to close your slides and re-coal. Re, re uh, <clears throat> before you start firing, I'll say the first thing you do you, look, you have a visual look at the size of your coal and the quality of your coal. What sort of stuff you've got. Um, in your case it doesn't matter because you, you're getting the same sort of coal every time. But some, we would sometimes get different batches in the tender. So if, if your coal size suddenly changes or, or the, 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 the condition of the coal suddenly changes along the road, you're going to have to make alterations to your jets along the way. Next point, uh, remember, I, I think i have talked under correction. I'm used to the Berkeley Stoker, which there's, there's, none, there's none left in existence anywhere in the world that I know of Berkeley Stoker, certainly not operational. The last, the last Berkeley Stokers got cut up in, in South Africa last year, the last three are in the Strategic Reserve. So everything is now HD Stokers, but the difference is your worm, don't ask me which way it is, but if I remember correctly, the worm on the HD turns one way and the worm on the, the Berkeley turns the other way. So that, that doesn't matter. So then, uh, what you do when you when you come on duty, you, you you stand over the stoker like that, over over the firebox door. Open your firebox door and op open your, your worm slowly. And because because your worm is turning a certain direction, it will put more coal on the table on one side than the other side. I can't remember now. I think it's the right hand side, but you will see. So you you will see that your your you, what you want you want an equal distribution of coal on your table to get so that you'll get a flat flat fire. Now obviously the worm is because it's turning a certain direction, it's putting more coal on one side than the other. So you compensate by that by, by your two veins. If you're finding you're getting too much coal, for example, on the right hand side, you bring your right vein in a little bit. So that you see you've got an equal distribution on your, on your firing table. Uh, so you want to you wanna make sure that when you start that the coal hits the, comes on the firing table distributed correctly. Correctly, yeah. That make, that to, com to, compensate to, for the, yeah. to compensate for the yeah, conveyor putting more on one side than the other. Some don't do it, again, it depends on every engine. You'll also get a difference, that's my next point, you'll also get a difference, your firing table, sometimes they can be put in slightly off centre, so then you'll get more coal on, on the opposite side or whatever. And sometimes they can be put on a little bit down or a little bit up, and sometimes we've had them where they're loose. I've had engines where the firing table's loose, so you get your pricker and you, you wedge it back in and try and get it level. Um, a further, a further method to equalize, it, it's not very effective, but a further method, if you find you're getting more coal on one side of the table than the other, uh, a further method, you get a, a pin, you've got three holes in, uh, just in front, just at the top of the conveyor, you've got three holes. If you put a pin in one hole, that also helps deflect some of the coal on the other side. In fact, with the Berkeley Stokers, we used to have what we called a Berkeley Iron. It was a special, this is irrelevant for what we're doing now, but with the Berkeley Iron, you had a, like an angled, piece of iron and we would, we would put it in and there was a way to wedge it in and it would then deflect the coal to the, to the other side if you needed to do that. So all, all the firemen with the Berkeleys, we used to walk around with the Berkeley irons. I think they used to put too much on the left side, but I forget now. Okay, well, well, you, you, you're going you're gonna to argue with me on this one, but when, <laughs> once, you, once you get to setting your jets, I open, I open the, the, the main valve fully and I leave it fully open and then I then I set each of the five jets individually depending on con firing conditions operating conditions and I play with them but uh, that makes more work for the firemen it makes more work for me the other way the other way is you 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 set your jets and then work it with the the main steam whichever way you do you've got to watch your boiler pressure if your boiler pressure falls and obviously your jet pressures are going to fall so if your boiler pressure falls then you've got to compensate so if you if you're only using your your your, your choke your whatever you want to call it your main valve, if your boiler pressure falls, then all you've got to do is open your, your main. Uh, but if if you're doing it my way, then you've got to adjust all four. So you, 
you, you, your fire will quickly get buggered up if the boiler pressure changes. It'll, it'll, if you've already, already got it set nicely and then the boiler pressure drops by 10 pounds, then you'll quickly get, quickly get up problems on, on your fire bed. Uh, so I can only tell you how, how I prefer to do it. Open that, open that one, the main, the main steam. Uh, your left back and your right back, back approximately half a turn, and your front jets are 100 kilopascals, which is what about 20 pounds. Uh, but you don't have you don't have gauges on on your individual jets. So the, what I was doing last year, I was doing it by sight. Um, and I keep the fine coal closed. We never, we were taught to keep the fine coal closed. 